Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Uh, really happy to see that uh, this is a well-attended session. Maybe some other people will join soon as well. Uh, it's really a pleasure today to have uh, Gael Barocco uh, as a speaker. Uh, he has a very impressive and long resume. I will not uh, go through it all. He's a research director working on data science in uh, France at Indria, and he leads the SODA team. Uh, but a lot of you uh, will know him uh, for uh, his contributions to the Scikit Learn that uh, he uh, co-founded, and uh, he's been working with Python, contributing to scientific Python. Uh, um, apart from that, of course, very highly cited researcher, uh, a very important name, and uh, some personal note. Uh, I was. Uh, uh, happy to learn that he spent some time in Florence, which is my hometown, and so I really feel happy that uh, he accepted the invitation to talk to us today. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Gail. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. And uh, thanks for thanks for being here. So um, I'd like to talk a bit about um, um, things around evaluating machine learning models, basically. Uh, and so uh, th this this uh, thought is originally uh, centered on um, on medical uh, applications, but it's much much broader. And maybe the really broad setting is that uh, to get a long story short, I'm frustrated by the mismatch between the overclaims that we see in many places and the reality of uh, uh, the models as we apply them. And it's especially true in, in, in uh, uh, academic research, but it's uh, not only in academic research. And I really think that if we want to have an impact, we need to test other problems better. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that the companies who use AI on a daily basis and have a revenue based on AI do this. Uh, so first, I just want to give a bit of a, a summary of things I've been seeing over the last few years. Uh, uh, so I, I spent a, a while uh, doing uh, um, academic research on um, AI machine learning and, and brain imaging. And the reason why I was interested in this is because brain images are, are complicated and, and very rich, and hopefully they can tell us a lot about the brain. And because they're complicated, we're going to use machine learning to, to, to model uh, this data. Um, and so, you know, people people didn't, uh, well, people were worried that we might uh, hit uh, uh, difficulties, uh, the, the biggest one being the heterogeneity of, uh, of the data. And so uh, years ago, we worked on the problem of uh, autism spectrum disorder, which is a particularly difficult problem because the, the, the settings are very heterogeneous. The, the disease itself is heterogeneous. There's no biological criterion for, for autism. And so the question we were asking was, you know, can brain imaging give us universal diagnostic criteria? And what, what we saw was that if we uh, had enough data, we could predict to new sites, we could predict to new uh, countries, to new continents, as well as we would predict inside an acquisition site. So this was telling us that, you know, if we have enough data, the, the heterogeneity is, is not a bottom. Now, enough meant, you know, thousands. And so we, we redid more recently uh, a blinded evaluation uh, of, this, uh, of this topic. We opened a competition. Uh, we set up a strong incentives, uh, you know, money if you were able to predict well on left out data. And uh, now the benefit of setting things like this is that I'm no longer involved in proposing the models to test. So hopefully my biases do not creep in. And hopefully the evaluation is more blinded. And so closer to proper evaluation methodology where the competitors cannot influence on the evaluation. And so you know, the, the results are there. What we're seeing is that if we, if we have a lot of data, then we get uh, you know, areas under the curve above uh, 0.75. And you know, if we 
we fit the curve and you look at where the symptoms, it is symptoms at around 0.8. And honestly, 0.8 AUC is clinically useful uh, prediction for a, a problem like this. So, you know, here I, uh, we're very happy. Uh, so, you know, conclusion is that, you know, large data sets and, and machine learning um, will just improve diagnostic and great. Uh, the talk is over. Well, the, the you know, the historical evidence doesn't, doesn't really show this and I, this was a, a paper that we wrote together with Veronica, whom I, I saw in the, the audience, and looking at the, the, the history of, uh, of publications in Alzheimer's research. Basically, to cut the long story, the long story short, it seems that, that numbers plateau. I mean, numbers plateau as a, a, a function of uh, uh, size of uh, the cohort, you know, larger these sets don't don't bring value, and more and more years of research don't really improve the the prediction. So, of course, you know that's not a final conclusion. Things things can and and will change. I'm I'm convinced that things will change, but uh, uh, these are not problems that are solved. So. When I, I go out of my little circle of uh, machine learning researchers and I, I talk uh, in, uh, for instance, in medical settings to biostatisticians, uh, what, what I, I, I've learned across time is that uh, biostatisticians do not trust machine learning. Uh, and the reason is that retrospective uh, analysis showed that uh, published results do not bring expected uh, medical benefits. So machine learning is a bad word. And why, why is that the case? Because uh, I believe our evaluation practices are not, are not strong. They miss the target, they're unreli un unreliable. And once again, you know, I could go through many, many examples of this. Uh, in, uh, in brain imaging, what we see is that the larger the cohort, the smaller the reported prediction accuracy. And I believe this is the case because on small cohorts, you can have a good prediction by chance. And if you have a good prediction by chance, all right, your paper gets accepted. On large cohorts, it's harder. So if we look at this, this autism challenge that I, I mentioned earlier, what we see if we look at uh, the, the data, if we analyze the, the course of the competition, what we see is that some of uh, the people uh, attending the competition uh, had uh, uh, overly optimistic uh, results on the data set that they had. They, you can see the, the, the black dots on the public set that are at the, the far right had very, very good results on the public set, but they didn't generalize to the to the private set. And so here we have analysts that overfit the public set. And the important point is that the incentives were aligned here. People had no interest in overfitting the, the, the public set. And the, the, the results of this challenge were actually that uh, the best performers were fairly simple models and models that are trendy in uh, in the literature, such as graph neural models, didn't uh, perform very well. You know, we can say maybe this problem is an academic problem and we can go outside academia and we can look at Kaggle. And so with Veronica, we, we looked at um, Kaggle in the scope of um, medical imaging and we, we analyzed the difference between the, uh, the score on the public leaderboard and the score on the private leaderboard. And, you know, to first approximation, these two scores are basically evaluation of the model on two uh, random samples of the population. And so what I'm showing you here is the distribution of the error in blue and uh, in, in red. What I'm showing is the difference between the best model 
and the 10 person best one. So if I rank all the models, it's the, the model that was uh, rank 10%. Uh, and so what you can see, and so I call this the um, uh, improvement uh, uh, gap, uh, for instance. And what you can see is that the evaluation noise, the, 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 uh, the spread of the uh, differences between those two different evaluation sets in blue, is uh, often larger than the improvement uh, between the best model and uh, the top, uh, the 10% best model. So we're clearly completely in diminishing returns. You know, all those 10% best models, this range of 10% best models are basically in evaluation error. And uh, we can even see sometimes that uh, uh, there's uh, not only variance in the evaluation, but actually bias, and that uh, uh, the private set uh, is actually significantly less good than the uh, public leaderboard, uh, and uh, that the improvement uh, is completely lost in this this um, overfit region. So the, the take home message is that you know on on those gaggle competitions, uh, many many uh, submissions. Uh, fall within the evaluation error. So we run a Kaggle competition, and then at the end, we can't even really tell, you know, which one is the best model that's lost in sampling noise. So is this only a problem of uh, medical imaging? I don't think so. Uh, doing an other work on, on tabular data, uh, what we, we saw was that, you know, despite many promising publications uh, in serious venues and from serious labs, uh, that were claiming that deep learning worked very well with specific architectures on tabular data. Uh, our evaluation uh, did not match this and uh, using uh, dozens of uh, tabular data sets uh, and optimizing uh, hyperparameters in a, a fair way between the different methods. Uh, uh, what we could see is that the techniques of um, uh, around trees, random forest, gradient boosting would perform significantly better than uh, the state of the art uh, deep learning, uh, uh, tabular deep learning approaches. And that's inconsistent with the literature. And those papers were from good labs. Okay, so we really have a problem. We, we, we really have an evaluation problem. And one of the reasons, by the way, is a simple one. It's just test set sampling noise. You know, if I draw 100 data points and I'm interested in a binary classification and I test my model on these 100 data points, I don't have a very precise estimate of the accuracy. And I can compute confidence intervals based on uh, very simple assumptions, a binomial distribution. And I'm showing those confidence intervals there, they're wide, they're huge, and they go down quite slowly. So first we have, you know, evaluation noise. And add to this that, you know, people, people are part of a process. They, they optimize the, the models uh, and, and they end up unwittingly mining this uh, this sampling noise. So we're really exploring this sampling noise and it's a, it's a hard problem, right? There's no, no good answer to this problem. Still, I think we can do better. Now, to keep going, there are more problems. One of the problems is that the data often doesn't reflect the applications we're interested in. And one of the reasons behind this is that we need data, we need a lot of data, so we grab all the data we can. One illustration that uh, with Veronica we found was that we, we could see that uh, in 2016, there was a large uh, lung cancer uh, uh, gaggle challenge that was published with a lot of data. And suddenly, all the AI people started working on, on lung cancer. Uh, obviously, finally, they had data. Data is always a problem. But it's not like lung cancer became more relevant to medicine and uh, 
to look at publications in medicine, they didn't get this increase that publications in, in AI got. So, you know, we grab the data we can, and in terms of maximizing our impact, that's not always the, the best thing to do. And there's, there's more to it. You know, we could go even, even deeper. The data that we, we grab uh, often reflects only uh, an application partly. There might be information in the data that's a consequence of the diagnostic that we're trying to establish. So for instance, we have a, a chest drain on the pneumothorax, pneumothorax x-rays, uh, and those chest drains are a consequence of the doctor uh, diagnosing of pneumothorax. We have uh, uh, skin lesions that are circled when they're malign and not circled when they're not malign. Uh, and and so the the AI picks up the signal and uses it to predict that's legit based on the data that we have, but it's also useless because this information is a consequence of what we would like to to predict, and we wouldn't have that in real application settings. And then of course we have uh, we can have sampling biases, so we can have a a target uh, a study population, the population that we have on which we're developing the, the algorithm that is not representative of our target population. And one of the reasons why we, in academia and in other settings, we keep falling in those problems is that we focus on, on um, uh, internal validity. Uh, so uh, having good prediction scores and that pulls us to more quote unquote beautiful data, things that work better. But the, the interesting focus should be external validity. So can I apply this to interesting and valuable cases? And you know, I could I could go on further here, but uh, uh, what what we've noticed is that uh, if we focus on imaging, imaging is only a small fraction of the the relevant information, and uh, and we can have you we can use other kind of data to get much better. Uh, assessment of patients uh, than only using imaging. And that's like more of a, I guess, uh, an academic and uh, a cultural problem is that, uh, for instance, we computer scientists like to focus on images because they're they're complex and, and we need to build complex uh, tools for them. But is that really the modality that we should be focusing on? Okay, so... Kind of my conclusion to this is that we're often more limited by the data that we have than by the, the learner, the supervised learner. And I think that's a, a, an important message. And maybe people in the industry can, can relate to this. Okay, so if we zoom out, we're limited by the data. And one of the big problems is that uh, we're limited by the size. And the size limits, of course, are, are training uh, the, our capacity to train powerful algorithms, but it also limits our evaluation because it creates a sampling noise in the test set. So it creates a rampant overfit uh, because the incentives in academia, but not only in academia, are to have uh, nicer looking results. And also the data we have might not be representative of the application, so we're developing useless solutions. So in my opinion, I think that often we need to shift our focus and to focus on integrating more and more diverse data and to focus on better validation. And then uh, uh, the, the application is often more than performance. You know, We're not interested in minimizing a narrow rate. We're interested in bringing value here. I'm taking examples in, in clinical settings. So we're interested in, in, in bringing public health uh, uh, value. And to, to do this, we need to understand how the predictions will be used in the clinic. And in, in medical research, the gold standard to establish this is to do a randomized trial. So you know, I can do a randomized trial between my uh, prediction logic from my AI and my current practice, which we call the standard of care. 
And the problem with this is that uh, first, it's very expensive. And then second, it can harm patients because when I do this, uh, I may uh, put some patients below the standard of care. So it, it leads to ethical problems. And if you look at uh, industrial applications uh, uh, on large uh, uh, internet uh, uh, companies, there's similar practices. You know, if I work on on online retail, I might do uh, what's known as A-B testing in marketing, which is basically a randomized control trial, a small randomized control trial to know if uh, if my my new policy here might being my my new policy being my AI uh, is uh, is useful. And so when we do, you know, our, our, our data science uh, validation practices, which are, you know, cross validation and these things, what we're doing is just proxies of actual clinical or business utility. Uh, so that's their limited proxy. The benefit is that they're much cheaper. So how do we make them more useful? And so for this, we need to develop better practices for uh, model evaluation. And this is what I'd like to talk about uh, today. So it's about raising the bar. And in, in, in research, it's about addressing questions such as distributional shift and better model validation. In terms of model validation, uh, a few years ago with uh, Xavier Boutillier, uh, we, we we looked at uh, the sources of variance in, uh, in the machine learning uh, benchmark. And one thing that really uh, stood out was the choice of hyperparameters. Uh, often with uh, uh, expensive models, this choice of hyperparameters is done manually by basically an expert uh, coming in. And then when you do this, there is variance that is related to the expert, and that's very hard to evaluate. So we uh, uh, advise to use, uh, at least in part of the process, an automated procedure. And one that is very easy to use is, is a random search. And the benefit of the random search is that if you stick in parameters that are, that are irrelevant, for instance, if you stick in the parameter that makes absolutely no change, to the to the model performance, such as the verbosity of the of the the estimator that you're that you're fitting, uh, you're actually going to get more data points in the other directions. And another benefit of the of the random search is that you know you you get IID sampling of your model space, and then you take the maximum. And so, if you want to estimate a bit your your variance due to your hyperparameter search. You can, you know, you can take subset of these IID samplings and take the maximum. So say I I, I do 200 random search. Well, I can take subsets of 100 and I look at the, 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 the maximum that I get. So here I'm, I'm evaluating a bit of variance that is due to the um, hyperparameter search. And another source, another major source of uh, uh, variance is the source due to the data sampling. It's, it's related to what I mentioned earlier is uh, sampling noise in the test set and sampling noise in the train set. Uh, and the reason behind this is that when you give me a study set, when you give me a data set, it's only a sample of the broader population I'm interested in. And so one way to evaluate this noise and hopefully drive down a bit the bias that we might have in a single test uh, data set is to do repeated train test splits. So over and over again, repeating train test splits. And then we can compute confidence interval uh, on test accuracy. When we're doing this, we're basically going back to classic practices of uh, cross-validation that are not used much these days because the models are expensive and people don't want to spend budget on model evaluation, which I think is, is, a, is a mistake. If we, if we want uh, to understand well uh, the confidence intervals, we need to separate two scenarios. 
One is comparison of algorithms, in which case I need to account for hyperparameters and train data center. So when I compare algorithms, this is what I do when I'm a, a machine learning researcher. Another scenario is clinical validation or application validation. So I, I, I build a model and now I want to, to put it in production. I want to deploy it. I want to you know, send it to hospitals or many other things. In, in which case I don't need to account for the choice of hyperparameter because I, I'm deploying a, a readily fitted model. Uh, and I, I don't need to uh, account for train data sampling. I just need to account for test data sampling. But I need to account for the fact that the population I'm, uh, I'm testing my model on reflects my application population. Elsewhere, uh, the, what I will have is, is not a um, good evaluation of the uh, application area. We also uh, need to get a good evaluation to worry not only about the variance, but also about whether the metrics that we use capture well the utility uh, that we're interested in. And it's important to understand that the utility is not only a function of prediction error. It's a function of uh, things like cost-benefit ratios in the, in the uh, decisions that we're making. It may be a function of context. And so people classically argue that it's important to go beyond a fixed threshold uh, binary decision. And also that a single metric will not suffice. And I, I, I'm convinced about this. Uh, there's only so much you can capture in an application setting in a single metric. We also can't look at 70 metrics. So it's important to choose a small number of relevant metrics. And uh, with Anika Reinke and many, many, many other people, there's a large uh, effort to do this. Uh, that's known uh, as a metrics reloaded. Uh, that uh, uh, get, tries to help people choosing metrics for the specific case of uh, uh, image-based prediction. And uh, for, for things such as uh, classification, uh, we, we cover a basic set of uh, metrics in uh, our tutorial uh, uh, paper with uh, Olivier Collier that has the, the same title as this talk. So I said that we want to go beyond a fixed threshold uh, binary decision and what, what's probably important in many applications is to have a control on the, a confidence score that is output by the classifier. The reason you want a confidence score output by the classifier is that you might move your threshold depending, for instance, on the cost of error. And cost of error may depend dynamically on the settings. And so for controlled confidence scores, people typically look at classification, uh, sorry, calibration measures. And here there's a bit of a misunderstanding because a calibration measure measures the average error given a classifier prediction. So the, the problem here is that the I, I may observe a controlled average error. So I may observe that in 60%, that if I take all the people that I've predicted with a confidence score of 0.6, I have 60% correct predictions. So my model is calibrated. However, I may have a subgroup in there where I have no error, 100% uh, perfect predictions. And another subgroup on which I do disastrously, and I have 20% success. And if those groups are balanced, I have the average of 20%, uh, uh, say 20% uh, uh, subgroup on which I'm, I'm performing really poorly and 20% subgroup on which I'm performing perfectly. On average, I'm calibrated, but individually, 
my confidence score is not good at all. So in application settings, what we would rather control rather than the, the calibration error is the individual probability. And, and that's really hard. Okay, I'm going to skip over a few slides because I'd rather uh, at some point take questions because anyhow, those slides are repeating what I said, but going more in details, as you can see, you know, talking about uh, sampling noise and um, things such as what are the arbitrary components of a machine learning procedure, such as the manual seed. I do not want to tune my manual seed it because it will not carry over to new data. Uh, what I mentioned that if we compare those, uh, uh, the impact of those things on the variance of uh, machine learning evaluation, what we find is that uh, what's really important is the, the choice of specific splits of uh, train and test data. Uh, and so that argues for cross-validation. I already said this. Hyperparameter selection, I already said it. And in my opinion, hyperparameter selection is one of the reasons why we uh, saw a difference between uh, our systematic benchmark of tabular learning and publications. I think the people in publication hadn't compared uh, the baselines to their proposed method with the same effort done in a setting hyperparameters. And so I argue for a random search and the figure that I showed was done with, with random search. Uh, so I argue for uh, reporting uh, standard deviation across multiple sampling of those of the arbitrary choices and including in the arbitrary choices, I include the train test split. Now, I want to go back. I, I hope this this wasn't too fast. I, I wanted to save time for a few things. I want to go back to the choice of metrics and I want to illustrate this in a common uh, situation, which is uh, the case of imbalance settings. Uh, and uh, the problem in the case of imbalance setting is that when I have a rare class, say uh, class one is very rare, I have 90% of class zero, then accuracy is, is uninformative. I, you know, if I predict always class zero, then I get an accuracy of 90%. So it's, it's not um, meaningful. And I can look at uh, uh, the error rate of class zero and class one, which will allow me to define uh, specificity and sensitivity. And then I can look at things such as balance accuracy, which is a mix of specificity and, and sensitivity. And, and, and people do that. But I, I claim we're not asking the right question because if you look at what sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity are, they are the probability of a predicted positive given a true positive for sensitivity and the probability of a predicted negative given a true negative. But this is not what we're interested in. We're interested in the probability of a true positive given a predicted positive in application setting. And this is the known as the positive predictive value. And I can compute it via Bayes' theorem to relate it to specificity and sensitivity. And if I do this, if I, if I do the math, I will have the, the prevalence that comes in. So the prevalence is the fraction of the positive class. And so what we can see here is that if I want to go from these, these metrics on sensitivity and specificity to metrics on the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, which are the ones that are interesting, then I need to account for prevalence. And so people sometimes use a summary metric that's a, a, an average of the PPV and the NPV that's called markedness. 
The drawback with these metrics is that they depend on the prevalence, so they characterize not only the classifier, but also the data set, which, which may be relevant because depending on your prevalence, uh, uh, you might want a different test. So if, for instance, you have a, a, a raging epidemic, an outbreak of, a, of an infectious disease uh, in the population and the prevalence has gone up to 20%, then you might want to use a different test than if you're looking for a very rare disease. Now, you can go beyond this and you can use what's known as odds and odds ratio. The odd is uh, the odd of A is the probability of A divided the, by one minus the probability of uh, A. And so you can look at things that look like odd ratios and, and there's something that's in as the likelihood ratio of the positive class. So is the odd of uh, the true being, the, the true positive given a predicted positive divided by the odd of a true positive. And you, you can do the math. And the math is done in our book chapter that is referenced with uh, Olivier Collio. It's, it's not very hard math, but you, you can do the math. And what you'll, you'll find is that it's the ratio of the sensitivity divided by one minus the specificity. But you can show that this is actually independent of class prevalence. So if this is the ratio of the pretest odd, sorry, the post test odd divided by the pretest odd. So it's really, you know, how much have I gained in, in, in information? And so I can use this to characterize my, my classifier here, my binary classifier uh, on, the, on the data set. And uh, given that this is independent of class prevalence, I can then transport this measure and apply it to a data set that has a different prevalence. So I can, I can uh, evaluate my data set on a balanced, uh, sorry, I can evaluate my classifier on a balanced data set and then transport this to a balanced setting. And if I want to compute uh, the post test odd, I can compute the pre test odd using the prevalence because the odds of a true positive is given by the prevalence. So this is very useful to extrapolate the cost test sets of uh, different prevalence. And it's uh, very important if you're looking at very rare events. So if we're looking at imbalance settings, uh, first, I, I, I like to say I've often read things that I, I think were posing the problem wrong. Uh, so if we're, if we're looking at imbalance settings, uh, I, I would uh, advise to look at uh, the PPV and the NPV rather than the sensitivity and the specificity and possibly consider the post probability or, or odds. And the reason I, I, I make those advices is that once again, we're interested in the probability of the truth given the prediction and not the probability of the prediction given the, 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 the truth. Okay, so one, one last thing before, before I finish, uh, I wanna come back to controlling the probability of the outcome. Uh, so once again here, we want to go beyond binary predictions. We want to predict confidence scores because those are useful to help decision-making, whether it's automated decision-making or, or uh, decision-making by a human. And as I mentioned, calibration only controls for an average error rate. So once again, I may have a, a classifier that is fully calibrated, but I may have strong heterogeneity in its errors, and I may have a subgroup on which it, 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 uh, it, it, it's basically uh, underconfident and a subgroup on which it's overconfident. So the fact that it's, it's calibrated on average doesn't mean that I don't have subgroups where it's underconfident and overconfident. So I don't control the individual probabilities. So one way of uh, measuring, controlling error uh, to individual probabilities is to use what's known as proper scoring rules. Uh, so proper scoring rules are, are uh, metrics that are minimum when the prediction 
is the true probability. And one of them is the Breyer score. The Breyer score is nothing more than the, the, the squared error, the mean squared error between the predicted confidence score and the observed binary label. And these things are minimal when the predicted confidence score is P of Y given X, which is what I'm interested in. So they're really good for model selection. We should use them for model selection. What they're, they're uh, not really good for is to conclude on whether the model is good enough to, to go in production, to, to give some form of absolute interpretation of the model because they cannot be interpreted as an error rate. They, there's no obvious scale. And so people have studied those, uh, those proper scoring rules and uh, have shown that you can decompose them in the sum of uh, an irreducible error, so the ir irreducible error is the error of your perfect classifier. And then an epistemic error, which is, in a sense, the distance to the best achievable prediction. And this epistemic error itself can be uh, uh, split into a calibration error and a grouping error. And so the calibration error is the one that people look at when they compute expected calibration uh, error. And so the missing component when people do that is the grouping error. So to, to give you a bit of a intuition here, I'm, I'm plotting a, a, a calibration plot. So I'm plotting uh, the true probability as a function of the predicted confidence. And what we can see is that on average, this prediction rule is calibrated. On average, the, the, the true probabilities average out to the, the for, uh, for a given predicted uh, confidence, they average out to the predicted confidence. But there's, uh, uh, there's variance. At the individual level, I have part of the classifier that is uh, uh, overconfident and part of the classifier that is underconfident. Now, so the grouping error measures this. It measures the dispersion of the scores. Uh, so th this, by the way, is work that was uh, uh, published at iClear this year with uh, Alexander Pérez de Bez and, uh, and Marine de Morvan. So I can't plot the plot I'm showing you in real life because this plot requires access to the true probabilities. And I never had access to the pr true probabilities. So what we did was that we uh, used a a learner to uh, estimate regions that uh, uh, separate heterogeneity. Uh, and, and in the paper, we, we relate uh, such a procedure to a bound on, on the grouping error. Uh, and, and we uh, uh, show that uh, uh, we can compensate for a bunch of uh, uh, sampling biases uh, in, in this van, and we can get a tight bound on the grouping error. So we so we contribute basically a procedure to estimate the grouping error, and then Excel is just uh, finishing a Python package uh, uh, to to uh, run this. So this does how this compares to the thing like a, a Breyer score is that if we estimate the grouping uh, loss and the calibration loss, we know that the ideal classifier has a zero grouping loss. So we can well, there's a natural scale. We can know how far we are from a, an ideal uh, classifier. And this may be interesting to decide, for instance, should I retrain or not? Should I try retraining or not? Or am I just you know, good enough? Should I just stop? OK, so to, to summarize this part, uh, uh, it's important that we control the error uh, on the probability of the outcome. Uh, applications typically need a good control of uh, this probability of outcome. Uh, and calibration error uh, controls uh, average uh, uh, error. This probability it doesn't control an individual error. So it's uh, not as, uh, uh, as uh, useful as uh, people uh, uh, sometimes think. But it's possible to control individual probabilities. And it's uh, done in uh, uh, the paper by uh, Alexandre Perez Level. Uh, at iClear in the associated uh, Python package. And the reason this is important is that we typically want to control more than binary decisions because always machine learning validation is a proxy of the error of interest. And we want to give the, the, the underlying system, whether it's human or automated, a way of uh, adjusting thresholds.
I'm, I'm, okay, I'm gonna go very fast through this. Uh, uh, the point being that sometimes predictions must be uh, must be causal. And uh, so we, we use predictors to make decisions. Uh, for instance, in health, uh, uh, I may predict the outcome of a patient uh, given a, a health covariant. And in practice, I may want to make a decision here. Uh, and, and then this decision might be to give a treatment. Uh, and then the, based on this, I may decide that I want to, uh, so to, 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 I may decide that I want to account for the effect of treatment. So I will add uh, in my model the effect of treatment. And then I will predict uh, given an individual with a given observed health covariate. If I treat this individual, I, I'm likely to observe the given outcome. If I, if I don't treat the individual, I'm likely to observe uh, another outcome. So uh, this is related to contrafactual reasoning, and there's a, an established uh, a framework uh, to, uh, you know, to do this and, uh, and to uh, ensure, well, at least to uh, understand the validity of this practice. Uh, and we can use this to do what's known as individual treatment effect, and there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, and the, the, the point I want to raise here quickly is that I can get predictors that capture much better one outcome than the other. For instance, here I have a predictor that captures much better the treated outcome than the untreated outcome. And the reason is that for people who are very sick, so people who are far on the on the, 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 the right of my diagram, I haven't observed untreated people. And so this uh, predictor uh, works well in terms of average mean square error on my full data set, but it is not a good causal predictor. <clears throat> On the other hand, here I have a predictor that's a kind of stupid predictor. It doesn't work well uh, uh, in terms of average mean square error, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, because it extrapolates much better in the the region where there is a, a little a mass. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a much better predictor in terms of causal inference. <clears throat> so. Standard uh, cross-validation and predictive accuracy measure standard mean square error, uh, and, and, and they're not good enough. Technically, there is a distribution shift between the error that we're probing in standard cross-validation and the error we're interested in. And uh, uh, sorry, to really cut a, a long story short, there are associated risks, measures of errors that uh, compensate for this, and they may need what's known as nuisance parameters, which is the propensity score, so the likelihood of being treated given the covariates and potentially the conditional mean outcome. So there's a bit more of engineering to use them. But if you use them, you select predictors that allow you to do causal reasoning. And if you don't use them, uh, it's, it's quite dangerous. So if you need to reason on the effect of an intervention when you're using a predictor, you need to be careful and to adapt uh, your uh, your model selection procedure. Okay, I really need to wrap up. Uh, this was a long list of many things to, to think about. I think we should all think more about how we do our model uh, validation. I also think that if we look at the broader picture, it's not also uh, only a technical problem. There's also a social problem is that we just like too much to have good scores. And so we need to change our our, uh, our focus on those good scores. Uh, so this is my team. I work in an amazing team. I don't have enough time to to credit them. and i will I will stop there. Thank you very much.